Welcome to Hope Church for Wenatchee. We are so glad that you decided to make time to be a part of our service today. Here at Hope Church, we exist for four main purposes. First, to worship. We want to encounter and worship the living God. Second is to connect. We want to have fun doing life together as friends, and we believe that God has asked us and called us to be in relationship with others. Third is to grow. We want to fall in love with God's word and understand his unique giftings in our lives. Fourth is to give, to bless our community, plant churches, and send missionaries. Here's what you can expect today. We'll start by jumping into the Word of God. Grab your Bibles, a pen, and a notebook. Along the way today, you will have opportunities to write down some reflection questions. At the end of the service, our hope is that you would answer those questions with those sitting around you. After the sermon, we will take communion as a church, as it has been our practice. Go ahead and grab some juice or wine and crackers in preparation for that. I would also like to encourage you to have a time of worship in your home. If you have a musician with you, have them lead you, lead you in this time of worship. But if you don't, we have provided a worship link right here on our page. Before we begin, though, let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much that we have the opportunity to be together even when we're apart, Lord, as your family and as your church. I pray, Lord, that you would just bless this time um, listening to your word, and Lord, that you would just convict our hearts of what it is that we need to hear, Lord, and speak to us, God. I pray that we would um, leave changed after this sermon. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts to hear a word from God today. Right. If you have a Bible with you, go ahead and take that out. We are in the book of Ephesians, going through the book of Ephesians together. This is week 15. So if this is your first Sunday with us, welcome. We're so glad that you're here and uh, hope that you can just jump right into what the Lord is going to say to us today. Uh, the book of Ephesians, if you're new to the Bibles in the New Testament, uh, which is the last one-third or so of your Bible. It starts with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You get to the book of Acts, and then Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and then Galatians, and then you're there, the book of Ephesians. Chapter 4, and uh, we're going to be in verses 2 through 10 today, but I'm actually going to uh, read starting in verse 1. Um, and just to, again, if this is your first Sunday here, just to kind of try to give some context and catch up really, really quickly. And I'm going to try to do this in like 10 and a half seconds because we have a ton of stuff to get to today. But the book of Ephesians is really broken into two parts. This is the Apostle Paul writing to this church in Ephesus, a church that he was involved with in helping get started. And now he's in prison and he's writing this, this letter, this pastoral letter. The first Three chapters are really a reflection on the, 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 the glory of God, the power of God, who God is, what he's done for us, the, the salvation that he's given us, the spiritual blessings that he's given us. And um, for, for this reason, it's, it's probably a favorite book of the Bible of many of yours, I'm guessing. Because it's, it's Paul just reflecting on this is who our God is. This is what he's done for us. And then right here, starting in, in verse 1 of chapter 4, there's this, there's this pivot. And it, it starts with that word, therefore, right? So in light of all these three chapters of amazingness about God that I've been talking about, therefore... This is the life that he is calling Jesus' followers to live. And we talked about this last week, but this is, this is Paul now s switching almost from theologian to pastor. And I don't know about you, but there comes a moment in your life where you need a pastor in your life. You need, you need to know how to live your life in view of all God has done. God has done amazing above and beyond anything that we could hope for or imagine. But what do I do about all these broken relationships in my life? What do I do about my kids? What do I do about my marriage? What do I do about the anger and rage that I constantly am feeling? What, 
What do I do? And so these last three chapters is the Apostle Paul pastoring this church in Ephesus. And my prayer for us here at Hope Church is that we would really open our hearts to what the Lord would want to say to us. That we would not be hard-hearted, that we would not be cold to what God would want to say to us. Because how many of you believe that he's a good heavenly father? Can I hear an amen? He's a good heavenly father. We can trust him. We can trust his voice in our life. If, if he comes and, and he speaks something to us that, that challenges us and, and causes us to course correct, he does it for our good. He does it because he loves us. He does it because he's our shepherd. He's a good shepherd. So let's open our hearts to what the Lord would say to us here. Here we go. Again, like I said, I'm going to start in verse 1, even though we're focused on verse 2 through 10. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. If you're here in this room this morning, just let those words soak into your heart. You have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, <clears throat> he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Can I hear an amen? So I want to speak to you this morning on the title, The Descending Life. The Descending Life. Here we go. Jesus, thank you so much for this time that we have in your word. God, speak to us. Give us soft hearts. Give us ears to hear what you are saying, what the Spirit is saying this morning. We invite you, Holy Spirit. God, we want to be transformed this morning through your word, through the renewing of our mind. Help us be prepared, Lord, to quickly repent when you are correcting us, to, to be willing to be shaped and molded so that we can reflect who you are. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. If you're going to follow Jesus into this, what I'm calling this, the descending life, you're going to have to understand one thing about Jesus. And that is this, Jesus is the treasure. Jesus is the prize. Um, this really came home to me during a, a season in uh, my wife Katie and I's life where we were really struggling financially. And actually had a, a number of other challenges as well. This was uh, back, in the, back in the 2000s. Uh, some of you remember well, some of you experienced with us the, the, they call it the Great Recession of 2008, the housing crisis that happened. That affected us pretty significantly. We, had, we owned several homes at that time, and all of a sudden we went from feeling really good about life and about how, how smart we were and how impressive we were at our young age to have all this investment to, 
oh man, I wish we didn't have all this investment that's now gone upside down and now I'm like way underwater in, in homes and, and looking at financial crisis and you know all the thoughts that go through your head. I don't know if you've ever been in, in this scary of a time, but like I'm wondering what it's like to be homeless and does, you know, is that next for us? And like it was very, very, it was a scary time. Like there was a song that we sang this morning where we talked about fear that takes your breath away. Have, have you ever been there? Like that was, that, I, like I identify with that. I understand that. And I was struggling with, uh, with, with the Lord. <laughs> I was struggling with the Lord in that season. And I didn't realize, I was trying to, you know, like I didn't realize I had a, like a root of something in my heart. And, and this was it. I had this thought that if I just followed Jesus and did everything right that he asked me to, that I would live the blessed life, right? I would be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And, and that if, if, if I wasn't healthy, wealthy, and wise, it was because I'd screwed something up back here with, with my following Jesus. Like, I, that's, that's what I, I kind of thought. But the, here's, the, here's the problem with this, and this is really the, the religious mindset and a legalistic mindset, the idea that you can somehow earn God's favor by just doing everything right. The problem with that is that the temptation there is that following Jesus becomes a way to get what you actually want. Following Jesus becomes a way to get the house that you really want. Following Jesus becomes the way to get the car, that, or around here, the truck that you really want. Following Jesus becomes a way to get the husband that you really want, the career that you really want. Becoming the truest version of yourself that you really want. And brothers and sisters, this is so important for us to know and remember that following Jesus is not, the purpose of it is not for you to live your best life, for you to self-actualize, for you to get what you want. When you follow Jesus, you get Jesus. He's the treasure. And when you get Jesus, when you make the decision to follow him, he is going to constantly call you into a way of life that calls you to lay down your life for those around you. And if you don't fully understand this, if you don't fully embrace this, you're going to be one very frustrated follower of Jesus. Because your goals and his goals are going to be constantly at odds. What he's trying to do in your life and what you're trying to get him to do in your life is going to be pulling in different directions. You'll be frustrated when, you, when you're reading your Bible because you're not going to like what you read. You're like, well, I don't, it must not actually mean that. I, maybe if I dig out the Greek, I would be able to understand, oh, okay, it is about me. That's what I thought. Right? You're going to be frustrated when you're praying because you're not going to like what he's calling you to do and asking you to do. Like, I must not be hearing from the Lord, right? <laughs> you're going to be frustrated in, in relationships because they're not helping you, again, self-actualize, become the better you. Because that's not what friends are for. Just newsflash. So the, consider with me this morning a life lived with a different goal. The Jesus way of life. A life lived with the goal of loving the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And then giving your life away for others. The descending life. The descending life is a radical way of life. You will only be able to do it by the inner strength that comes from being full of the Holy Spirit. We read this in 
the previous chapter, Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church, and which is kind of the, the hinge that this whole book turns on. He prays that we would be full of the Holy Spirit so that we would have the inner strength that comes from his spirit. You will not be able to live this life in your own strength. So, what does the descending life look like? Number one, let's go to our, our passage now. <laughs> be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. How many of you are just like nailing this one right now? Oh, yeah. How many of you need to turn to the person next to you and apologize for something you said on the way to church this morning? <laughs> right? Like, we need help in this area. I don't know if it's like an American thing or just a human thing, but like, we're two words into this verse, and already, like, Paul's like, challenging us. The Holy Spirit's challenging us. <laughs> How many of you, your impatience comes from others just not having gotten the memo that we're actually the center of the universe? And if everybody would just kind of work that way and work around us and understand that, right? If our spouse would get that a little bit better, Life would, life would go so much smoother. If our kids would understand that for sure, life would go better. No, we're called to make, look at this, make allowance for each other's faults. What does that mean? Be patient. Allow people to have faults. Because you love them. Verse 3, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. When you lead this kind of life, when you follow Jesus in this way, when you're willing to live a descending life, you don't have to constantly be competing with the people around you. Now, if I'm just perfectly honest with you guys, this is an area that the Holy Spirit is really working with me on. Caleb knows this about me, my brother-in-law. <laughs> He's played Settlers of Catan with me before. <laughs> I love to win. I, lo like, I love being the guy that just wins at everything. Like, if, I, if I'm not going to win, I'm not sure that I'm interested. In, like, I love winning. <laughs> yeah, some of, you, some of you feel me right now. And look, it's not bad if you're focused on winning in the right areas of life, right? Where it becomes a problem, though, is when you start competing against people you shouldn't really be competing with. Right? I was talking... <laughs> I was... Uh, I was uh, we were talking about this... Uh, before church started is Katie and I have to be really careful about games that we play together because we just go into this competition mode and start like trash talking each other and, if it, and it's normally me first I'm like okay I'm in done with this this is I do not appreciate your attitude right now <laughs> like I just I love competing right and again where we get in trouble is when we start competing against each other. Right? Within, within the body of Christ, we start competing against each other. We think that it's a game somehow that we're, we're, one of us is supposed to get higher than the other, be more impressive than the other. Our church is supposed to be more impressive than the church down the way. How many people did you have baptized this Sunday? <laughs> Good try. You know, we had a few more than that. I won't even share our numbers. I don't want to embarrass you. Like, like that, what, what? We're competing against the wrong people. Why does Paul say, make every effort? Did you notice that word there? Make every effort. Don't make, don't make some effort. Don't make even just a lot of effort. He's the, the inspired word of God says, make 
every effort. Why? Because unity takes effort. I don't know if you've noticed this, those of you who have been around churches for longer than like a week and a half. Unity takes effort. Effort. It takes work. It takes reaching out to the other person, initiating a conversation. It takes listening. It takes effort. But can I just remind us this morning, it is worth every effort. Can I hear an amen? This is, the, this is the word of God, Psalms 133. Listen to this. God commands a blessing where there's, where there's unity. There's a spiritual principle here that there's a blessing that comes when there's unity. Psalms 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down the, the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. And then look at this, verse 3. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. There is a blessing where there is unity. It is worth every effort. So practically speaking then, he's like, okay, David, I might be able to be convinced that it, that it takes, or that, that it's worth every effort, but what does it actually look like? Well, I think, I think 1 Corinthians 13 is probably a pretty good practical guide for how to make every effort. You guys ready for this? Some of you know this passage. This is what it looks like to make every effort. Love, what's the first one? It's patient. Dang it! Again, with the patience. Like, apparently, we need that. It, it, in, in churches, we need patience. In our marriage, we need patience. With our kids, we need patience. What's the next one? Love is kind. Now, now, now think about, like, Remember the, uh, the, the comparison that I was confessing with you guys? Think about that now, uh, or the, the, um, the competition, right? The competition, right? The spirit of competition. Think about that, especially those of you who are athletes, those of you who, who uh, love Michael Jordan, love Kobe, right? like the assassin kind of, like, like they don't just beat their competition, they stomp on the neck of the competition, right? Like, I love that. Like, you, you know, you, you want to get me excited, start talking about those kind of com competitive things. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> it does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. If you're, if you're a fellow like habitual competitor like me, when you get to it is not easily angered, how's that one land in your... Like, that, that, like some of you who have done sports, you know you, you're your best when you are ticked off. Like you, you play okay and then you go into rage mode and then you are like, unstoppable. And look, I, I'm not saying anything about anybody's tennis game or golf game or anything. Like I'm just, I'm your pastor, and I'm asking you to consider that maybe that attitude in church realm, in marriage realm, in kids realm, and yes, maybe in your golf game too, the Holy Spirit might want to change a little bit. Some of, some of the people that we've held up as heroes may not be reflecting God's image. Oh yeah, I'm not only halfway down the list here. It keeps no record of wrongs. Okay, okay, I, I have to stop here just because, again, how, okay. Again, I love sports, okay, so bear with me for a minute. How many of you saw the Michael Jordan documentary? Anybody see the Michael Jordan documentary that, that dropped in the middle of COVID? How many of you just loved it? It was like reliving the 80s and 90s glory days. I was like, I was there. It was like, oh my goodness. 
It was back when the NBA was a lot of fun. Anyways, <clears throat> uh, do you remember the stories about Michael Jordan and how he would, he would, he would make up anything, anything he could think of to uh, create like a slight about somebody, like somebody had slighted him or disrespected him. And, and that was how he got himself up for, the, for, for, for like these monster games that he would have. And, and they, they told this one story of this time where he literally made up a scenario that never happened, told everybody about it and went out and like completely destroyed this team. <laughs> okay, so anyways, again, Maybe, just maybe, some of the people we've held up as heroes, some of the way that they have done their lives might not be what we want to take into our own lives. Just maybe. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoice with the truth. Again, we're talking about how do we, how do we make every effort for unity? It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes, it always perseveres. If we are going to actually do real life together in Hope Church as brothers and sisters of, in, 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 in a church family, we have to stop competing with one another and we have to start living this way of life, the descending life. If you're gonna do life group together well, Life groups are our, our small groups here at Hope Church. If you're new to, to Hope Church, this is one of, the, one of the things that we encourage everyone to be a part of is, is being part of a smaller group where you're, you're, you're growing together and sharing burdens together and sharing really good food together. If you're going to do life group together well, you're going to have to start doing life this way. If you're going to serve on a, on a team in, in, in a church, well, it's not a competition. You're not trying to become better than so-and-so in, in some area of the church. No. You're going to have to learn how to do life this way. If we're going to have unity in, in, in Hope Church as a church, we're going to have to get really good at life, doing life this way. Uh, again, I know we have some, some folks here that are here for the first time, and so this is kind of maybe a news flash or some folks that haven't been here for a little while, but we're getting ready or in the process of, of purchasing the Living Hope building downtown, which anybody else still excited about this? I'm pretty excited, right? And we're going to be co-sharing that building, co-sharing that building. Guess what that's going to be an opportunity for? That's going to be an opportunity for learning how to live the descending way of life. If we're going to do that well, we're going to have to learn how to make every effort. If we're going to have unity with other churches in Wenatchee, how many of you believe that would be the will of God for this valley? Right? And wow, we're, we're so blessed to have this, this developing partnership with Living Hope. We're so blessed to have, again, if this is like news to you, I'm sorry I don't have time to tell you all the stories, but Sage Hills is a big part of this acquisition. They're, they've, give, they've given us $100,000 to help us do this. It's, Pam was telling me, she emailed me, this is a miracle. <laughs> this does not happen. It's a miracle. Right? They are making every effort, I would say. And so we can do that too with, with other churches, right? Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. Verse 4 For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and in all and through all. Why can we have unity? Because this is who our God is. Right? Let's, let's major on the majors, and let's get really good at minoring on the minors. Let's, let's, let's be really, really clear. Okay, what are the, I've heard it explained this way, the closed-handed 
issues and the open-handed issues. What are, what are the issues that are just very, very clear that Scripture says this is what is right, this is the way of the Lord, and to violate it is to actually go against the way of the Lord. There, there, there are some of those areas, right? The, the, the deity of Christ and that he was 100% man, that he 100% God, 100% man. That's a closed issue. The, the fact that he was born of a virgin, closed issue. The fact that he died on a Roman cross and then three days later was physically, truly risen to life. If you let go of that, you're, you're, not, you're no longer in the Christian faith. That is, the Bible says, that is the central cornerstone on which our entire faith is built. That Jesus actually, truly, physically resurrected from the dead and is alive today. That is a closed issue. Right? The, the, what, what Scripture says about the sanctity of marriage has a lot to say about it. And I know lots of people, it's not popular in culture right now, so there's lots of people saying, now did God really say, yeah, no, that's a closed issue. But brothers and sisters, there's a whole bunch of other secondary issues that you can have a friendly conversation over a cup of coffee with. It's like, now tell me how you came to that interpretation on, on this. And you can still walk together as brothers and sisters in the faith. Maybe you don't go to the same church as them. Maybe you're not going to sit under that teaching, but they are your brother. They are your sister. And so w- let's get really good at, at just, be, just embracing that, right? Just saying, hey, you know, praise the Lord that you believe that way. I love you as a brother. I love you as a sister. Let's get really, really good. There's one body, one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. All right. Verse 7. However, he's given each of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. This is why Scripture says, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Okay, let's, let's kind of reflect on this now. This is kind of an interesting passage. I don't know, how, how many of you have read this passage and kind of just pondered it and be like, Paul, what are you saying there? Like, I actually really enjoyed getting time to just kind of sit with this, this the, these, uh, I think there's two verses there, and just really, really thinking through this. So there's two big things that I want to have us meditate on and think about from this passage. The first is this. Okay, just go back. If you have your Bible, kind of look over that, that, those verses right there. However, he's given each one of us a special gift. First thing, it should prompt us to tear down the wall between the sacred and the secular in our minds. When we think of, when we think of ourselves, especially if you're not in full-time ministry, which is like 99% of us here in this room, if you are his people, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have been given a special gift. And as such, I want you to think about this, you are a gift to his people. Right? Jesus has given you a gift, and it's not just so that you can say, hey, look at my gift. Isn't that amazing? My gift is pretty awesome. Okay. No, no, no. He's given you a gift to be a part of the family of Christ, the the, the body of Christ. We all have different parts of the body and together we reflect who Christ is. So you are a gift to his people. So if you don't know what that is, ask him. Seek the Lord. Observe, observe the fruit of your life. If you've walked with him for very long, at, just look back over the, the course of your life and, and notice what it is that the Holy Spirit prompts you to do. Right? When you're in prayer, what is it that he's prompting you to do? What, what do you find he often does through you as you obey what he's prompting you to do? What, what is it that 
What I have found, and we talked about this, we spent almost six months talking about spiritual gifts, but the best way to, to discover what your spiritual gift is is just to obey the Lord, just to do what he's asking you to do. And it's almost like in the rear view mirror, you'll be like, oh, that, look at what God did when I went and prayed for that person, when I went and told that person about Jesus, when I went over and made a meal for that person. Look how God used that. You'll, you'll begin to notice this pattern, and you'll begin to notice these gifts that he's given you. At, at Hope Church, we, we like to talk about how we are a bivocational church. Now, if that's a new term to you, it's kind of a churchy word just to mean that we have, uh, as, as pastors, my wife Katie and I have, have two jobs. We own a business and we're, we, we're, we, we're pastors. But it's not just that we are bivocational, we are bivocational. Hope Church is a church of where all of us are embracing the reality that, yes, we have often a, a job that we're, we're earning our income from, and we are ministers of Jesus. We see our whole lives as ministry, our whole lives as worship. You're ministering when you lead a small group, and you're ministering when you're leading your team at work. That's ministry. You're ministering when you're discipling a new believer, and you're ministering when you're just being a mom to your kids at home. You're ministering when you're counting the offering at church, and you're ministering when you're doing the tax return at work. It's all ministry. You're ministering when you're, you're preaching and you're ministering when you're doing a sales presentation, right? You're ministering when you take a meal to somebody and you're ministering when you are the one who is, because of your job role, sitting by the bed of the sick and the dying at the hospital where you work. It's all ministry. We live life, all of life as ministry. All of our life is worship to the Lord. So that's number one. It should prompt us to tear down this idea in our head that we have our secular life and we have our sacred life. No, no, it's all ministry. All of it is an opportunity for you to use the gift that God has given you to minister to those around you. And by the way, it's not an accident where you work, do life, go to the gym, all those things are God's opportunity for his gift to bless the community around you. Okay, second, it should prompt us, this thought about the fact that Jesus has given gifts. He's given each one of us a special gift, is what Paul says. It should prompt us to think this way, is that we should be open to receiving ministry from one another. Not just from the pastor, from one another. Let's trust the gift of God in our fellow brothers and sisters. Amen? Now, it's not to say that we don't use discernment, right? There's not to say that there's not a process of growth and maturing of our gifts. But let's make our default mode to be one of trust and acceptance. When, when you see your brother and sister, our, our response should be, you're such a gift to this church. Vicki and Randy, you, you're, you're such a gift to us here at Hope Church. Pam, you're such a gift. I could just, I, I, how, how long do you want me to do this? I'll just keep call, going around the room, right? Each of you is a gift that Jesus has given, amen? Now, one more thought here. You probably noticed, and this was kind of, this was always the thing that kind of puzzled me a little bit about this passage. You might have noticed that Paul uses a military image here in these verses. It's a picture of what the, the Roman army would do when they conquered their enemies. If you've ever, re, if you've ever uh, researched Roman history, you would, you would probably know this about them. What's that thing that's going around Instagram? How often do you think about the ancient Roman Empire? 
I won't take that poll in here. But a lot of us think about it a lot, it turns out. And so they would, they would return from conquering their enemies. And they would lead a whole crowd of captives as they came into the city. All the, the people that they conquered, they would lead that crowd of captives into the city. And then the conquering hero, the, the great general that had led the, his army victoriously, would then give gifts to all the people from the spoil they had taken from their enemy. Like, David, what on earth does that have to do with anything holy and good? Okay, think about this with me for a minute. Jesus is our conquering hero. On the cross, Jesus conquered sin and death. He laid siege to the wall that separated God from man, and he utterly destroyed it. And he's giving you and me the spoils of that victory, right? He's giving us great and priceless gifts. And guess what that gift, those gifts are? It's each of you to each other. Listen to this. He, he's given us, what, what it says that he's, he's led, led the captives, right? He's, he's, he's conquered death. He's conquered death sickness and sin. He's conquered all these things. They are captives under King Jesus. And now he's giving gifts, gifts of forgiveness, gifts of the presence of God in our lives, gifts of an outpouring of his spirit on all flesh. You guys remember what Acts chapter two says? Listen to this. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. I'm going to say that again. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see vis uh, yeah, visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In those days I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will all prophesy. Jesus has made this possible. We know that this was fulfilled starting in, in Acts with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But the reason that is possible is because of the victory that Jesus won on the cross. The spoils of the cross, listen to me right now, brothers and sisters. The spoils of the cross include your sons and daughters prophesying. The spoils of the cross include your young men seeing visions. The spoils of the cross include your old men seeing dreams. The spoils of the cross include both men and women alike prophesying. Jesus has won this for us. These are the gifts that he's given to his people. We're going to get ready to take communion, and so... As I uh, go ahead, and you can bring the table forward here. And I want to I end with, with this thought here. This is verse 9. Paul says, notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. The same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Hope Church, this theme is all through the New Testament. God has defeated his enemies. How? Through humility and sacrifice. He ascended by descending. And the one who humbled himself is now the one who has ascended higher than all the heavens. He is the one who fills the entire universe with himself. So here's the question then. Is there an area of your life where God is calling you to descend? I'm warning you right now, you probably will not hear a single voice outside of Scripture and the Holy Spirit cheering you on to do this. In fact, all other voices will constantly tell you what your itching ears want to hear. 
children, don't listen to your parents. You tell them what you're going to do. Wives, don't submit to your husband. That's an outdated, horrible way to live and do marriage. Husbands, don't lay down your life for your wife. Part of you is going to die if you do that. Employees, don't give your your employers deep respect and fear. That would just be weird. Do what's best for you. If you're not familiar with what those passages are, that's all stuff that Paul is going to get to here in the next coming chapters, the things that he's calling us to do in this descending life. I'm telling you, it's a different way of living when you follow Jesus. Why Why is the... Why is it the opposite of what we hear in culture? Because what we hear in culture is what culture knows you want to hear, right? It's good for clicks. It's good for webinar signups. It's good for book sales. It's good for a large counseling business. Like they, they figured out how to sell stuff to us. Do you know what will never be popular? the way of Jesus, the descending life. And, and Hope Church, listen to me. If you're waiting for it until it's popular to do life this way, you're going to be waiting a really, really long time. If you're waiting for all the so-called experts to tell you that the way of Jesus is the way that you should live, it's not going to happen. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with people thinking that you are throwing your life away because you're doing what God has asked you to do. We really have to get over the desire to have everyone speak well of us if we are going to follow Jesus. Jesus is calling us to a life that descends. What are we going to celebrate here at the communion table in a moment? the ultimate act of laying down one's life. God, the creator, just think about that, the creator of the most, like our brains can't even comprehend the universe that he's created. And he comes and does this for us. This is who who we're following. He's going to call you to a life like no other. (laughs) But is he worthy of it? Oh, yeah. He's worthy. So would you stand with me? Here at Hope Church, we practice what we call open communion, which is... Well, it's time to take communion now. So if you have um, some juice or crackers or just anything, um, we'll just take a moment to go and get that. And um, we just are so grateful that we get to do this together as a church family, which is to remember the body and the blood of our Savior and what he has done for us. And I was thinking about this today, and um, I was like, you know, I think today we just need to, um, let's take it from a position of victory so that as we take the the bread and the juice and as we remember what our Lord has done for us that we just stand on that we stand on the victory that he has given us you know sometimes our circumstances they don't look very victorious (laughs) things that have happened this past week you're like man I just don't I don't feel that victory but today right now in us taking communion we are going to remember okay God has given us the victory he is working in our situation we have been made new through the body and the blood of our Savior and so let's just stand together in that place of victory and just believe and just remember and be thankful for all that God has done for us I'm going to read one scripture and it's found in Colossians it's chapter 2 verses 13 to 15 And so I'm going to read it right now. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. 
In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Isn't that great? So we have that same victory because we have been made alive with Christ. He has given us the victory and he has shamed <laughs> all of those powers. So he has shamed them publicly, it says. So it's like, uh-uh, you're not getting away with that. And so right now, I would just like to agree with you today that as we remember, this is a time of remembrance, that we also remember that we can stand on the victory that our Lord Jesus has given us. So if you want to go ahead and we'll take the cracker right now, and I'm just going to pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your body. Lord, we thank you for everything that you have given us. Lord, we remember all the pain and the suffering that you went through for us. Lord, so that we could be free, so that we could be made alive with you, so that we could be made the righteousness of God through you, Christ Jesus. Lord, we just thank you. We, we thank you for your healing that comes through the stripes that was born on your back, Lord, that you have given us the healing, as it says in Isaiah. We thank you that by your stripes we are healed. Lord, we pray for healing to be released to each person, Lord, that is struggling with a sickness or with an illness, Lord. We thank you that we have healing through your body, Lord, and through what you have done on the cross. Lord, and as we take this cracker, we just remember and we are so grateful for all that you have done. Amen. And so now we're going to take the cup and just and let's just pray over this right now. Jesus, we thank you for everything that you have done for us. Again, we are just so grateful. Lord, we thank you that you have shed your blood, that you went to the cross, that you took all of our sins upon yourself, that you suffered, that you died, and that you rose again. And so we thank you, we remember, we are just so grateful for everything that you have given us. And we stand on your victory today. We stand in that place of all that you have done for us. And we just receive it, and we just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. In your mighty name, amen. Thank you, everyone. It's so great to do this together, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Before we close today, I want to take a moment and thank those who've partnered with us financially. Lives in our valley are being changed because of your gift. If you'd like to support this ministry financially, there are a couple ways to do that. The first is you can give by texting any dollar amount to 84321. You can also give online at our website, that's hopechurchwenatchee.com, or through our app. And last, you can mail your check to 14 North Wenatchee Avenue, Wenatchee, Washington, 98801. So I'm going to go ahead and pray for our offering. Lord, as we give in today's offering, we thank you that you are a God of abundance. We know that you will provide all of our needs, and for that reason, we trust you with everything that you've given us. Lord, we know it's not ours, but that it is yours, and we want to watch you multiply it far beyond our ability. Thank you for your blessings to us. Would you bless this offering? Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We pray that you've been blessed and encouraged by this message, and we're praying for you and believing that God's best is still ahead. Go and have a hope-filled week. We'll see you next time.